This is the Insurance Law Podcast, brought to you by Best Recommended Insurance Attorneys. Welcome to the Insurance Law Podcast, the broadcast about timely and important legal issues affecting the insurance industry. I'm John Zuba, Managing Editor of Best Recommended Insurance Attorneys, including expert service providers. We're pleased to have with us this morning Derek Royster and Matthew Curtis from RGL Forensics, a leading financial investigations company with worldwide offices and coverage, specializing in the economic analysis of major claims for the insurance industry. Derek Royster is a partner in CPA who works extensively with insurance companies and law firms to quantify economic damages and provide litigation support in high-value and high-profile claims and cases. His engagements have taken him on assignment throughout North America, Central America, Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean, Matthew Curtis is a senior manager who is both a CFA shareholder and a CPA licensed in the state of Texas. He specializes in the practical application of financial, economic, and valuation principles to solve a variety of client challenges. The scope of Matthew's work includes providing analysis for mergers and acquisitions, corporate strategy, and commercial disputes. And we're very pleased to have you both with us this morning. Today we'll be discussing business valuation and the impact in the courtroom. And for our first question this morning, uh, Derek, from a defense perspective, what are some of the ways an attorney can defend and attack expert valuation testing? Sure, certainly. Um, There's a number of ways. First and foremost would be to attack the the qualifications. Um, And uh, since we're talking about a business valuation context, You know, an expert attempting to calculate a business's value will normally have a business valuation certification. And there's a number of them out there. Um, The American Society of Appraisers has the AM and the ASA. The AICPA has the ABV. Uh, The National Association of Certified Valuation Analysts has the CVA and the ABA. And then the Institute of Business Appraisers has the AIB. AIBA, the CBA, and the MCBA. Um, each of those certifications has a differing requirement, um, but each requires the applicant to pass a written exam. Now, further, you know, uh, you can look at an expert's, you know, their qualifications can be evidenced by, you know, their training, experience, prior testimony, author publications, positions held in industry associations, and so forth. Um, but, you know, generally the attack of credentials is difficult and usually occurs, a lot of times when I've seen it, is when the other side uses an in-house expert, such as a controller or CFO, that may, that may not have a certification or the training in business valuation. So qualifications are one. Um, another one is, you know, what is the expert trying to calculate and did they use an appropriate methodology? Um, you know, from an insurance context, you know, obviously on a first-party property insurance claim, you know, did the expert calculate in accordance with the conditions of the policy or the contract? Um, if you're looking at from a commercial litigation perspective, lost profits, you know, has the expert established that there's a reasonable link between the allegations and the measured damages? Um, what is the damage period being used, and is the length of time appropriate? That's another way I, I see quite often. Um, if the expert's calculating future damages, have they been discounted to present value? Because a failure to do so will overstate the damages. Um, another issue with methodology that we see is, did the expert calculate lost profits versus loss, uh, lost business value, or did they calculate both? And if they calculated both, is there a duplication? Um, and then... In regards to business valuation, did they use an appropriate business valuation methodology? And, and Matthew's going to get into some of those um, later in the, in the podcast. Um, another way is, did the expert base their analysis on a number of assumptions rather than facts? So from a TAC perspective, if so, uh, you know, I, the defense attorney should have the expert explain whether in deposition or cross-examination at trial the assumption that they were used and then attack those assumptions? You know, for example, how would the calculation have ch- had changed had they used a different assumption? Um, another way is to identify the information the expert considered and, re- and relied upon. You know, were there certain facts and or documentation that was pre- presented in discovery that was not considered? If that wasn't considered, why not? And if it was considered, how would the analysis, the calculation changed? Um, another way is have the appropriate professional standards been adhered to. Um, you know, review from a defense perspective, 
review the standards for the organizations and the governing bodies to which the expert holds credentials. For example, you know, the ASA and the AICPA, as I mentioned before, and others. And did they, you know, did the expert prepare the analysis in accordance with those standards? Um, another way is to attack the lack of consistency with prior testimony or uh, publications and writings and so forth. I mean, recognize that each case is different, but the application of methodology and theory should be applied consistently. So if you're to look at the experts, author publications, articles, presentations, you know, look at prior transcripts, uh, we'll provide insight into their position and, and either support or question the credibility. And then, you know, obviously attack any errors that are found. Um, a lot of the, some of the major areas that we see are from an opposing expert is failure to consider causation. You know, were there other factors such as new competition, industry, or economic, economic downturns that, that may have impact, for example, may have impacted sales that were not considered? Um, you know, failure to consider all relevant data. If there's information that was provided in discovery, as I mentioned previously, that is important and relevant that wasn't considered that may impact the valuation. Um, failure to consider mitigation is a big one. You know, what was the damages mitigated? And there's a number of ways that, uh, you know, a business may look at mitigation to mitigate their overall exposure. And then, the you know, the typical, the mathematical errors are the inconsistent applications of growth rates, discount rates, and, and so forth, um, premiums, capitalization rates. And then, um, you know, a lot of times we'll see things being double counted. So those are a number of, there's obviously others, but those are a number of ways that, um, from a defense perspective, uh, uh, counsel can attack uh, expert valuation testimony. Uh, Matthew, can you briefly define the Daubert standard and some challenges there? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's helpful to have a, a little bit of background when talking about Daubert, just so people have a framework for understanding why it came about the way it did. Um, you know, prior to Daubert, we had what was called the Fry Standard, came out of a, a case in the 20s, um, and what was basically ruled in that case was for scientific evidence to be presented, uh, it had to be uh, generally accepted uh, for it to be admissible into a, a trial setting. Uh, that, that presented some problems uh, as advancements in technologies and processes occurred that the, uh, the rate of acceptance wasn't always as fast as your ability to get that evidence uh, into a courtroom. And you also had the interpretation of different judges trying to determine what was generally accepted and what wasn't. So to address this, um, we had a, a, a Chief Justice, Earl Warren, who uh, came up uh, with a panel to determine what is now referred to as the federal rules of evidence that got enacted into law in the 70s. Um, and based on this, there was a, a court case, it was a pharmaceuticals case, uh, Daubert was uh, the plaintiff in that case, and what, what ended up coming out of that case was a, a more general framework based on the federal rules of evidence that was more lenient in what could be admissible uh, into a courtroom in, in terms of scientific evidence or, or uh, what you would refer to as expert testimony. Uh, in general, what you're looking at there is a lot of what Derek just covered uh, in terms of how you can attack an expert valuation. Um, and you can kind of frame it into three different buckets. Uh, the first one being qualification. Uh, does the expert have the qualification, the knowledge, the experience to answer the questions that they're being asked? Uh, that's the uh, credentials and the knowledge part of it that he spoke about at the beginning there. Uh, the second question is, is the evidence that is being proposed, is it relevant to the question at hand? Is it probative? Does it answer the questions that are being asked? Uh, and then the third part is, is it reliable? Uh, it's, it's interesting the way uh, that it seems to be interpreted right now. Um, you don't have uh, as, as many um, challenges based on qualification and relevance as you do on the reliability, um, probably because those questions are more easily answered. 
Uh, there's a little more ambiguity around what is considered reliable and what isn't. And it's left up to the judge or the trier of fact um, to parse out um, what is reliable. Um, has it been sufficiently demonstrated that it can be put in front of uh, either them for consideration or the jury for consideration and have questions about um, whether that's the appropriate methodology or not to use uh, to be parsed out through the competing testimony of the experts or whether it's sufficiently unreliable enough that it should be excluded and not even presented for consideration. So that's kind of where we are uh, with Daubert right now and, and kind of how that works and uh, you know, generally provides a, a framework for considering those aspects of, of expert testimony as it comes into play in these cases. Derek, can you uh, tell us how insurance claims value standards affect or impact value results? Well, we often see claims being submitted uh, against a first-party property insurance policy, you know, in which covered property has suffered damage due to some, some covered peril. Um, you know, these same claims may ultimately end up in subrogation against a third party with the first-party property carrier seeking recovery from the party alleged to have caused the loss. Um, and then these claims can also be found in lawsuit filed directly against the third party and in turn as a claim against the third party's commercial general liability policy. Now, while the general economic theory and concepts are the same in each setting, the loss, cover, the loss recovery will certainly be different in the property setting as the insurance contract is the differentiating factor. You know, for example, um, you know, these claims are subject to the conditions set forth within the contract or the policy. Um, some of these limitations and conditions include policy language regarding a covered peril, actual loss sustained wording, applicable waiting periods and deductibles, coinsurance requirements, uh, monetary limits and time limits for ordinary payroll, actual loss sustained requirements, as I mentioned, and then the time limits for loss recovery. Um, so it's, it's basically the same theory. However, there's going to be differences because in a commercial litigation or a third-party setting, the loss is really the true damages, whereas uh, the, you've got the insurance contract in the first-party property. Um, for example, on the property damage, a lot of times you'll see replacement costs or actual cash value. Um, and actual cash value, and it, you know, this is more of a general definition because it may differ from policy to policy, um, but generally, it's the amount it would cost to repair or replace insured property on the date of the loss with material of like kind and quality with pro proper deductions for obsolescence and physical depreciation. Whereas in, you know, in a commercial damages perspective, um, fair market value and under a valuation may differ from actual cash value. And, 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 and that may get into that a little, a little more. Um, so really, you know, the primary difference would be um, the limitations within the contract versus when you look at it from a third-party perspective or from commercial litigation. So with the policy language being the different differentiating factor. Okay, thank you, Derek. Matthew, can you comment on the nuances of the three business valuation approaches? Yeah, sure. So they're typically... Uh, three approaches that are most commonly used among business valuation professionals. Um, you have a what's often referred to as a comparable companies ap approach. You have a comparable transactions approach, and, and then some kind of income approach, uh, often is a you know, something like a discounted cash flow analysis. Um, so the the first two um, are you know kind of lumped together in. in what are referred to as market analyses, and, and they're referred to as market analyses because they're based on observing transactions that occur uh, in a marketplace. So, for instance, in the comparable companies analysis, uh, you would select a universe of, of companies that are similar to the subject company and observe the prices at which shares in those companies are priced uh, as investors and shareholders uh, ex trade those shares back and forth. Um, for comparable transactions, rather than um, individual shares being bought or sold, it's the entire company being bought or sold. Uh, so it's a different marketplace and different types of transactions, but uh, it's still at 
at the end of the day, a, a market transaction that happens there. Uh, and then you have the, the income approaches, uh, as I said, is often a, a discounted cash flow or a capitalized earnings model, uh, something along those lines where it, uh, the business valuation is dictated by the amount of income or cash flow that it generates, um, and it's, it's based on an expectation of what that cash flow generation ability or earnings power is going forward into the future. Um, and so those, those approaches tend to be the most commonly encountered. Um, there are some others um, that people have started using that tend to be hybrids of those types of approaches. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, those three provide a pretty good framework for understanding um, the basis for the, for the valuations and, and the resulting value conclusions that come out of those. Uh, so, Derek, uh, which approach would typically work best for insurance defense claims in particular? Well, kind of back to my previous comments, in a first-party property perspective, generally you wouldn't see a valuation uh, approach um, in terms of, of you know, trying to quantify a diminution in value of a business because under the time element provisions, it's generally limited to a time period or a dollar amount. Um, but if you looked at it from a commercial damages or a third-party liability um, if you go back to what Matthew mentioned, there are three approaches. One particular approach is not necessarily better than any of the other two. Um, more times than not, you'll see the income approach, but I've seen the other approaches as well. Okay, and when is the best time to get an economic damages expert involved in a particular case? Well, from from our opinion, timing is critical, and and, you know, we feel the earlier you can get a forensic accountant or economic damages expert involved, the better, um, especially because that expert can help identify, you know, the accounting and financial considerations of the case and can identify potential problems early before they snowball. Um, you know, the, the expert can assist with the, the preparation of document requests and help with, you know, questions for interrogatories prepare questions for deposition and cross-examination. Um, you know, it's always difficult if an ex- we as experts get involved late in the discovery phase or, you know, even after discovery is over, because at that point, you know, the, the amount of documentation um, that you can get could be limited or there may not be any additional information you get if discovery is closed. So in our opinion, I think the earlier the better, certainly. Hey, Derek and Matt, thank you both very much for joining us today. Certainly, our pleasure. Thank you very much. That was Derek Royster and Matthew Curtis from RGL Forensics with offices and services provided worldwide. And special thanks to today's producer, Frank Vowinkel. And thank you all for joining us for the Insurance Law Podcast. To subscribe to this audio program, go to our webpage at www.ambest.com slash claims resource. If you have any suggestions for a future topic regarding an insurance law case or issue, please email us at lawpodcast.ambest.com. I'm John Zuba, and now this message. Best Insurance Professionals and Claims Resource is the top website for locating qualified professionals and need-to-know insurance information for the claims market. Brought to you by AM Best, the world leader in insurance industry information. Visit ambest.com slash claims resource.